Saturday evening games. It is good to see each of you here today, brothers and sisters. We know that there are those who, who were unable to be here this morning. We are glad you were able to be here this evening. We are thankful that we are able to come out to be able to worship the Lord as we are supposed to do, as we know we are blessed to do. We will bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we assemble here once again this evening to worship you, praise you. Father, we pray that we will set aside the cares of this world, the distractions thereof. Father, we pray that we will focus on our worship of you and that we will do all things in a pleasing manner. Father, we pray for those who are here that each one of us will take note of your word, will take these things to heart, apply them to our lives, live as you would have us to live, Father. Father, we pray that you will strengthen us through your word, that we can grow in knowledge of your will, do what is right in your sight. Father, we pray that you will strengthen us. Father, we pray for those who aren't here, that we can be an encouragement to them, that they will come at the next point in time. And Father, we pray that we may reach out to the lost, a lost and dying world, Father, and encourage others to heed the warning, obey the gospel, Father. Father, we pray these things humbly in Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. If you will open up your Bibles to the book of Amos, Amos, depending on how you, where you're from, Amos, A-M-O-S, Amos. I, I know I have a, a habit of saying Amos, and I said it again, and I'm sure it actually is Amos, but I guess that southern in me just keeps popping out. But Amos chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 12. Here we find, and if you know much about the Old Testament, uh, before we read and, and, and really discuss this, if you, if you know much about the Old Testament, you know that we see, we learn, and it is there for our learning, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 11, and, and through chapter 4, verse 11, we see that, and among other texts, that it's there for our learning, there, or there for our, 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 you know, that we can, can, learn from them, be it they are examples to us, in many cases, examples of what not to do. Well, we see how that often uh, that, that God strived to bring his people back to the truth. Read the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah, says that he rose up early and sent his prophets often trying to tell them to straighten up. It didn't work necessarily, not because God was inept, not because His Word was insufficient, but because they simply did not care or refused to be obedient. Here in the book of Amos, in chapter 4 and verse 12, we see God through Amos here says, Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. He is, he is correcting them, and He is telling them that they need to straighten up, and they need to, to be obedient. The song, you might know, if you notice the song that Jerry picked, number 633, the, the text there is actually Amos 4 and verse 12. And we're going to talk a bit about that and how that we know they were told, they were warned what was coming, they were told what was going to happen, and brothers and sisters, they were told because of all these things to prepare to meet their God. Brothers and sisters, we serve that same God. We profess to at least. We say that we serve the God of heaven. The one true God, we understand, and we talked about that this morning, and we understand. If you noticed in, in the lesson that we talked about this morning, we talked about how that there is one God, of course, that one God consisting of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And the Bible clearly teaches these things, brothers and sisters, and, and we see that. But we serve that God. He is the God that, that was the God of Israel. He is the God of us today. And He is warning us in His Word. He tells us what's coming. He tells us that the end is coming. Someday, brothers and sisters, let us be certain, someday the Lord is going to return. He's coming back. And, and certainly we see that that is the case. Jesus, there in Matthew chapter 25, or 24, 25, 26, there in, in, in the context, we see that Jesus is, is talking uh, to them, and, and he, he addresses, and there's much in these chapters that you, you can take note of, but in chapter 24, a text that is so often misunderstood, and one, brothers and sisters, I admit that, that I have gone back and forth on, I pointed out that that they there are basically three positions, I would say, in this chapter. One, that it all applies to our future. Two, that it all applies to our past. And three, that there is a breaking point in the chapter. That is, that the events that you read up to about verse 35 are occurring at, uh, during AD 70. And that after that, it talks about Jesus' return someday. I pointed out at one time or another over my life, I probably, I know, I held all three of those positions. But brothers and sisters, we see here, he says in verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We see that he tells us, and, and we take this, of course, that dividing point there, and we look and he... he points there to someday the, the Lord returning, not to, not to set up His kingdom on this earth, as millennialists will grab a hold of this text and try to apply all of this to this so-called millennium. We're not talking about that, but someday He will return. We know that, brothers and sisters. And I submit to you that the Bible is, is full of texts that teach us that someday He's going to come. And he teaches us, in fact, what will happen when that happens, brothers and sisters. We read there in chapter 25, we read the parable of the virgins. We read that of the talents. And we read there beginning in verse 31, and I just note the little comments there, the not inspired, the little comments there at the top of, of uh, at the beginning of, my, uh, of chapter 25. And you see those dividing points, and and brothers and sisters, each one of these is teaching us about, and we learn many lessons, but they are teaching us about His coming again. He's coming back. And we need to recognize that He is coming back someday, brothers and sisters. You consider the parable of the ten virgins. Five wise and five foolish. And it teaches about righteousness. And it teaches about preparation. It teaches us about that the five wise were prepared when the bridegroom, when Christ returned, when the sound went out and the bridegroom cometh, they were ready, they were prepared. And then the five foolish, they were unprepared. Give us of your oil that we might have some, they said. Not so, lest we don't have enough. You go and buy. And of course, while they went to buy, the bridegroom comes, he goes in, the doors are shut, they are outside the door. Brothers and sisters, the lesson's clear there. He's talking about someday when he returns and our being unprepared. The parable of the ten, of the of the talents. We know, of course, uh, the the talents, the one talent man. One talent man, what does he do? He gave five First, notice in verse 15 of Matthew 25, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to a, another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Notice 
As I pointed out before, first of all, the word talents here is not talking as we use them, as abilities, as, as our talents, if you will, but it's, it's a form of money. And notice they already had abilities. They were given talents based on their abilities. God isn't giving them abilities so they can do things. He's giving them talents, we might say, and I would submit a better responsibility, a, a better term that we could use that as if we want to translate it into something other than money, is responsibilities. He's giving them responsibilities based on the talents that they already have, the abilities that they do have. And, and brothers and sisters, he, he gives these to them, and of course what happens? Five-talent man, he puts his to use, he gains five talents more. The two-talent man, just likewise, he puts his to, to use and he gains two more. The one-talent man, he's afraid. He goes and buries him. The master returns and what happens? Five-talent man brings his forward and he says, here's five talents, here's the five talents more. Same with the two-talent. And notice something there, brothers and sisters. Both had the same response from their master. The two-talent man wasn't told, oh, you didn't gain more. You didn't gain enough so that you could be equal with the five-talent man. He said, well done, a faithful servant. He, he, God didn't expect him to do more than he could do. God expected him to do what he had the ability to do. Look about you, brothers and sisters. There's a problem that we have. I, I mentioned, of course, in, that Olivia and I were looking at the book of Genesis and in the Bible class, and we, we're starting to look, and we're going to go through. Uh, of course, it will take some time. But we're going to go through and look at all 66 books of the Bible. That's going to take a while, I, I know. But it is, it is my intent over time for us to do that, to spend time in looking an overview of these books. But, but we need to recognize, brothers and sisters, that God expected them to, to do what they could. He didn't demand of them more than they they had. He, he expects us to serve Him based on what we have, what we are able to do rather than not. The problem came when the one talent man, what did he do? He was afraid. He went and hid it. He let his fear control him. And we were warned in Revelation 21 and verse 8 about that fear. And, and we are told of what happens with Fear, what it can do, the consequences thereof, <coughs> that we might also invoke lazy, laziness there, of not putting his talent to use. Perhaps there were some issues there, but it, it, he does express, if you take him at his, his word there, he expresses that fear. And what did his master, what did his Lord say? His Lord rebuked him, didn't he? <coughs> Notice beginning in verse 24 of Matthew 25. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not straw. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. Here's your talent. He didn't steal it. He didn't go out and waste it out here, just buying something frivolous. He just simply... Went and hid it. Stuck it in his pocket, we might say. Carried it around. Watched and kept it where no one could steal it. Surely he must be pleased. Notice verse 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not straw. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast you the unprofitable servant on, into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, he saith. Notice what the one talent man did. He convicted himself, didn't he? By his own words, he was judged. 
because he knew what was expected of him. Brothers and sisters, there are many today, and, and we take these, these thoughts that we see in the, the, the parable of the ten virgins, and, and as we look here at specifically the talents, if we take those brothers and sisters and we start comparing, we, we recognize some things, don't we? Many people today know what they need to do. They know what the Bible says. They know what it is. There are those certainly who are ignorant of the truth. They've never been taught and, and they need to be taught. But there are those who know what they need to do and they simply refuse to do it. And brothers and sisters... They're going to be, I mentioned today, this morning in the lesson, uh, there in John 12 and, and verse 48, that we are judged by, by the Lord's words. The word of God, we're going to be judged by, and that's true. But brothers and sisters, we need to recognize, the Bible teaches that we're going to be judged by our own words. Certainly by, if we are using profanity, we're doing that which we ought not to be doing, saying things that we ought not to be saying, but, brothers and sisters, there are going to be many people who are going to convict themselves because they've turned around and admitted they know what they're doing because they, they know what the truth is. We watch, if you watch police shows, and I've watched enough of them, brothers and sisters, I assure you that if I ever get picked up for something, even if I'm guilty, the only things that I'm going to say to the police officers is I want a lawyer. Here, give me a lawyer. I want a lawyer because what happens? You have a right to remain what, silent. If you give up that right, if you choose to give up that right, whatever you say will be held what? Against you. Brothers and sisters, now, I don't have to speak. God knows my thoughts. He knows what's in my heart. But let me be clear that if I know the truth and I say, yeah, well, yeah, I know what I need to be doing, I know what the Bible says, and I just simply choose not to, then I'm convicting myself by my own statements. I'm stating that I know the truth, and I've seen people who have done that. I've, I've shared this story, this event, on multiple occasions, but it seems appropriate at this time. I remember being in preaching school and, and going out and, and and um, a couple of us uh, there, uh, there three of us I think there, and, and one of the guys who was ahead of us, and I see him sometimes, he does live programs on Facebook, and uh, he was talking to this guy, and we came up, a couple of us who were behind him, and, and we stood there, and, and I just stood there and watched, and he, he talked to this guy, and, and the guy stood there in tears member of the church and he knew he wasn't being faithful but his wife was a member of another religious body and basically had told him that he could have the church or he could have her and he couldn't stand the idea of losing her so he was not going to church he was not doing what he knew he needed to do and yet he stood there and he said he knew brothers and sisters that's a sad thing we know that many people face those problems. And I've seen it on the other end where people have walked away from their families or their families technically walked away from them because they obeyed the gospel because they went and accepted the truth. And their family cut them off because they'd have nothing to do with them if they were going to be a part of the body of Christ and not their denomination. Brothers and sisters, we may face such things. But be assured, as, as terrible as we, as sympathetic as we may be for someone like this fellow that was standing in his yard crying, his words will convict him. I don't know whatever happened to the man. I, I, I don't think I'd recognize him if he walked in the door. I'm, we happen to, I happen to see him that one occasion, and I don't know him, but, but brothers and sisters, this man, if he doesn't, straighten up, if he doesn't do what God has told him to do, his own words will judge him, because he knows. He said, he recognized, he knew. Brothers and sisters, these texts, back in Matthew 25, these texts teach us that we need to prepare 
And, and we need to be prepared for His return. As Amos points out, prepare to meet thy God. Over in Luke chapter 15, we see, and again, I'll just share with you what, what the little notes say there. The parable of the lost sheep of the piece of silver of the prodigal son. Brothers and sisters, I had a, a brother point out one time, and I think he was right. This we often view as three parables. It's one. It's one parable. It's just three examples in the one parable. And what you find here is you find that of the lost sheep, you find that of the piece of silver, and you find that of the prodigal son. And you have uh, examples of each. And we see the, the parable of the lost sheep. He gets lost, but he doesn't know what to do. The sheep is lost. He knows he's lost, but he doesn't know what to do. So he needs to be told what he needs to do in order to correct it. You have the, the coin. The coin is lost. It doesn't have any idea that it's lost. It doesn't know what it needs to do. So what do you do? You have to teach it that it is lost. You have to teach it what it needs to do. And then, of course, the prodigal son, who knows that he's lost, knows what he needs to do. And brothers and sisters, he needs to be encouraged. The prodigal son, of course, returned, didn't he? There's actually a fourth example in there. And that's of the big brother. The big brother who's there... And, and this is the point of the lesson, in, in fact, that Jesus is teaching here. The older brother is the point. That he is, he is the Jews in this case. The Jews, these religious Jews, they're the older brother. Because what was the, his problem? His brother went off and, and was lost and squandered his father's money, which is not to be commendable. We don't commend such, but he, he came to his senses and came home. He repented. And instead of rejoicing that his brother had been set, returned safely, what did he do? He gets mad. He's mad at his dad because his dad has killed the fatty calf. Brothers and sisters, sometimes, and, and it seems like that's who we, in fact, preach to, isn't it? We get up here and and teach, preach. We're actually preaching to the ones who are here, but, but sometimes we're the ones who need to hear the most, aren't we? Because those outside there, they're lost. Those in the world, they're lost. But brothers and sisters, sometimes we have that spirit of the older brother where we're angry at the people who are out there. Rather, we ought to be rejoicing, trying to reach them and bring them to the truth. Brothers and sisters, we are taught in these texts of what is coming. In Mark, or excuse me, in Matthew chapter 25 again, I want you to notice beginning there in verse 31. We're not going to read down through the whole section, down through verse 46, but, but I want you to notice We'll just read just a little bit and, and, and discuss this for a moment. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all of the angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall, divide, and he shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on, on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You know, I don't know if I've ever thought about this, but it struck me just now. There in Revelation 13, verse 8 I believe it is, we see Jesus pictured as a lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Brothers and sisters, did you catch that same phrase here that, that the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world there at the end of verse 34? He prepared these things from the very beginning. Jesus was counted as slain from the very beginning because it was going to take place. These things are prepared for those on the right hand 
as he in his illustration, those who are prepared to meet God. Brothers and sisters, we need to recognize that he promises here, and, and he lays out very plainly, and you go down through here, those on the right hand, come inherit the kingdom, prepare, come pre this, 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 these things prepared for you, the kingdom again, prepared for you from the foundation of the world for, because we might say, you've done these things. And notice he doesn't say because went to church. Now he teaches in other texts that we are to go to the worship service, that we're to be here. Notice he didn't say it's because you read your Bible. Now the Bible teaches us to do that. He didn't tell us because you went, and, and, and because you did a lot of things that we might say, well, that's the reason for me to go to heaven. <coughs> these things are needful, but brothers and sisters, he in fact says, because you were doing these good things, because you were giving food to those who were hungry, water to those who were thirsty, drink, it says, because you took me in when I was a stranger, because you did these things. Now, these others need to be done. You need to be here for, for worship service, obviously. But, but brothers and sisters, we need to not neglect the others either. These things ought to have been done and the others, what? Not undone? Not left undone? Jesus said that, of course, in another context. But, but the same idea, the same message. And then, of course, he goes to the goats over on the left-hand side. And what does he tell them? Verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? For, because, in fact, you didn't do these things. Brothers and sisters, understand. We can sit here in this room. We can come every time the doors are open. We can come here. We can listen. We can... We can read our Bibles, we can pray, we can do those things, and if we're not careful, we'll still not end up lost. Because we're not doing these things. But the lesson tonight isn't specifically on these good works that we, we might list off here that Jesus talks about. But he, he, he does make that point, and of course there in, in verse 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Brothers and sisters, he is warning us through his written word here that someday he's going to return, and someday the judgment is coming. And either we're going to be on the right hand, or we're going to be on the left hand. And brothers and sisters, I can turn around and you'll be on the right hand and you'll be on the left. <coughs> but understand this. Someday that's going to take place. It may not be in our lifetime. Many say, Peter points out, many say, all things are the same. Nothing's changed. It's all the same. We wake up in the morning. We go to sleep at night. Sun rises, the sun sets. It rains today, it sun shines tomorrow. But brothers and sisters, the Lord isn't slack. We know Peter points that out. The Lord's not slack. Counting his promises. The book of Genesis, we see faithfulness. The faithfulness of God. We talked about that in our Bible class this morning. Olivia and I did. The faithfulness of God is laid out in there. We often think of the covenant, the 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 word covenant. I, I pointed this out to Olivia, and I'll point it out this, this evening that, that we often think of the covenants. God's covenants. And what do we think about? There's two covenants, right? The Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the New Covenant. Oh, those two exist, but those aren't the only two. I, I pointed out to her, you know, we think about Noah and what comes to mind. Many things, obviously, the ark and the animals. But what do we see today that should remind us all every time we see it of no rainbow? There is a promise from God. God put the rainbow in the sky as a promise of the covenant that He made not with 
just Noah and his family, but he made with every creature in the world. And brothers and sisters, I believe he made that covenant with everything alive. Everything that breathes air. He made that covenant that he's not going to, to destroy the world by flood. Oh, there's floods that happen. I heard the other day that Tennessee's getting another flood. They get a lot of those. And, and I think there's been some floods here in Missouri in various parts and, and so forth and, and different places. But brothers and sisters, what you won't find is where he destroyed the world by flood again. Oh, it's going to be destroyed, as Olivia pointed out. It's going to be destroyed, but it won't be water that gets it next time. And I pointed out to her that we don't have to worry about that because none of us are going to be here when that takes place. We're either going to be in heaven or we're going to be in hell. And what happens to all of this isn't going to make much of a difference to us. Brothers and sisters, in all those covenants and, and the covenants that he made with Abraham, and, and of course Genesis 3.15, the covenant he made there that, that he told Satan, told the serpent that Jesus was coming. And, and, and all of these various covenants that we see with sometimes individuals, sometimes groups of people, sometimes everybody. These are all covenants and God is faithful to carry them out. Read the book of Genesis. Read the whole... Old Testament and watch as Jesus or as God through time brings about until the fullness of time as Paul points out in the book of Galatians the fullness of time he brings Christ into the world God is faithful brothers and sisters and he's promised he's promised someday the Lord's returning and we're going to be judged judged by the things we do in this life Judged by whether we are obedient to Him. He is the author of eternal salvation unto all those who obey Him. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. God, through Amos, there in Amos 4 and verse 12, God tells them, warns them, and it's a warning, brothers and sisters, He's telling them, I'm going to do this. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Brothers and sisters, someday the Lord's returning, and He said He will. And because He is returning, we need to make sure we are prepared to meet our God. The Bible tells us how we prepare. We're outside of Christ. We prepare by doing what needs to be done in order to get into Christ. We hear the Word that, that teaches us what we need to do, teaches us about Christ, about what God has done, what Jesus did, dying on the cross there. We are told what we must do in order to be saved, how we must, be, we must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of our sins, confess Him to be the Son of God, and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of our sins. I don't see anyone here tonight, this evening, who, to my knowledge, has never obeyed the gospel. But if I'm wrong, or perhaps someone will have the opportunity to watch this on the internet, and if they need to, then I would encourage them to do so. If you're here and you need to obey the gospel, I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, friends, to do so. Or maybe you're here and you're a Christian, but maybe you look at your life, maybe you, you realize, yes, I've obeyed the gospel, I, I've, I've done these things, and I, I've been baptized, and, and I've come up, and, and I've risen a new creature, but somewhere along the line, I've wandered away. The prodigal son wandered away. And the father, who is God in this case, what did he do? He watched long for him to return. Brothers and sisters, if we have stumbled, if we have walked away from God, he's longing for us to turn back to him to seek his forgiveness, and he promises that he will do so. He promises that he will. Of course, if anyone watches this, and they need to repent, they need to turn, I would encourage them to do so as well. If you're here this evening and 
you have them. We encourage you to you come while we stand and while we sing. Kill the soul.